Aloha. I have a remarkable story to tell you. It's about a project which happened over 30 years ago. It has to do with an airport, a bird, and what the state of Hawaii did to save this bird's habitat. refuge located in Pearl Harbor's West Lock. It provides a safe habitat for water birds and especially the aeo, the Hawaiian stilt, a native species, an endangered species that is now thriving. But this was not the case in 1970. In 1959, Hawaii became the 50th state. Optimism was tangible. The economy was booming. Buildings were going up and visitors flocked to paradise. A modern airport was needed to accommodate this influx of tourists. The airfield had already been expanded. The major runway, 826, after the degree headings on the compass, was widened to 200 feet and lengthened to 13,104 feet over two miles long, making it the longest runway in the world at the time of its completion. But Hawaii needed a proper terminal to bid aloha to the visitors from around the world. In 1959, Governor Quinn broke ground for the new Honolulu International Airport Terminal. A year later, 1.6 million passengers arrived at and departed from Honolulu International Airport. The number almost doubled to 3.4 million in 1966. 22 airlines had requested Trans-Pacific routes. In addition, Pan American Airlines and Boeing announced plans to put 747 jumbo jets into operation. It changed the way you handle passengers, the way you handle pack, uh, baggage, how, how you load and unload the passengers, how you refuel it. The numbers were at least twice as large. By 1966, the new Honolulu International Airport was already outdated. The airport master plan study of 1968 projected that 18.5 million passengers would arrive in Honolulu in 1985. To handle the increase in tourists and to accommodate the physical requirements of the jumbo jets, the airport needed to renovate its terminal and build another runway. The additional runway had to, above all, increase the capacity of the airport. More landings and takeoffs per hour with planes landing and taking off simultaneously. Because the runway was required to share the airfield with the United States Air Force, situated next door at Hickam Air Force Base, it had to be wide and long enough to meet Air Force and Federal Aviation Administration standards. And there were two other major concerns. The runway needed to be angled so that jets taking off would not endanger metropolitan Honolulu, and far enough away not to disturb the peace and quiet of its residents. The initial plan was to build the runway on existing landfill created by the dredging of Keehi Lagoon. Formed at the mouth where Moana Lua and Kalihi streams meet the ocean, Keehi Lagoon lies directly east and adjacent to the airport. Once ringed with fish ponds, the coral reef, marshland and mudflats provided habitats for native birds and wildlife. During World War II, the lagoon was stretched to widen the channel in order to relocate civilian seaplane traffic out of Pearl Harbor. Pan American clipper ships were then able to embark and land to and from the mainland without interfering with wartime activities. The coral dredged from the lagoon was used to expand Honolulu Airport. The remaining mudflats provided a major feeding habitat for the aeo and other native water birds. As far as the number of birds or the variety of kinds of birds, uh, it was a, a revelation to me really that the number of uh, shorebirds, migratory birds that use the uh, Keehi Lagoon area and particularly the mudflats. There's a, a triangle out there, or was a triangle, 
that uh, supported uh, many birds from the mainland that migrate every year uh, when the mud flats are exposed during low tide. And the other surprise was a large number of the Hawaiian stilt, which was an endangered bird. And uh, as I recall in those early days, uh, the average number of birds out there buried, uh, Hawaiian stilts, buried between 90 and 105. So that was a lot of birds. And they weren't there all day long. They were there to feed when, at low tide. In 1971, the airport task force convened by Governor Burns under the guidance of Director of Transportation, Dr. Fujio Matsuda, recommended the building of a reef runway. Yes, when we decided that we need to have a, a new airport that will handle the larger airplanes and larger uh, peak loads, uh, we looked for a, a different place to build it because it's a lot easier to build a brand new airport where you have nothing else going on. But unfortunately, we did not have that luxury. They came up with a proposal that we should build a parallel runway, parallel to the existing long runway, but further out towards the sea. So that would correct not only the uh, capacity problems by building a, another runway that could operate simultaneously with the existing long runway, but also correct the problem of overflights, which this could be accomplished. Even though this runway still pointed toward the city, it was far enough away from uh, the terminal building and the old runway that it would allow the aircraft to make a turn towards the ocean uh, and stay clear of, of the, uh, the city. The offshore airfield would be about the size of Waikiki, over 1,200 acres of land created by 19 million cubic yards of dredged coral. It would accommodate a runway 12,000 feet long, 200 feet wide, running parallel to the main runway, 826, over a mile away at the old airport, the new runway would be called 8 right, 26 left. Finally, it would be connected to the main airfield by two taxiways. It was the first offshore airport runway in the world. Building a large man-made peninsula would be expensive. The funding for this mammoth construction would come from two sources, the Hawaii State Legislature and the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. They did come up with uh, estimates which seemed a little bit conservative, which were quite conservative. However, you have to keep in mind that this uh, proposed offshore runway was the very first one that was developed in the U.S. Consequently, through additional design changes, recommendations, and all that, the cost did increase considerably. The FAA basically came back and, and stated that, the, that a concentration of funding from the FAA would probably be about 50 percent. The final tab for building the reef runway came to $88 million, and the FAA's contribution was significant. The FAA contributed $53 million. Now that was not a percentage type function, it was just these are the basic parts of the, con the project that were eligible for federal involvement. That was a limit of the funding. In 1970, it seemed that all needs were assessed and all points of view were considered, except for one thing. The plan did not take into account the destruction of a bird habitat of an endangered species the Aeo, and other water birds which fed on the mudflats offshore and in nearby Keehi Lagoon. For years, the Aeo, the Hawaiian stilt, had made its home on the wetlands where streams met the ocean around the island. But now, the construction of the reef runway threatened a prime feeding area. Specifically, the Fish and Wildlife Service were very concerned, and of course there are citizens who are concerned about, uh, you know, uh, the Hawaiian stilt uh, and, and, and other wildlife. So this was before the NEPA was passed, but uh, there are other laws in place that required us to look at these uh, situations and to mitigate them. Uh, we could not just go out and disregard any wildlife and, you know, and, and do whatever we were required to do in terms of engineering. The National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, was signed into law in 1970. The law required that all major projects having an effect on the environment in the United States needed to be evaluated through a study called 
the Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. Well, uh, Dr. Matsuda, of course, uh, uh, was an excellent leader. And he did have a very enlightened view of the environment because uh, he told us at the time that uh, even though NEPA had been passed after we had initiated the project, and theoretically, we were not, it was not necessary for us to comply with NEPA, he said we should comply with NEPA and show that we were good stewards, that we were concerned about the environment. It was under his uh, direction and uh, urging that uh, the environmental process uh, was undertaken as part of the uh, reform and construction. It's uh, basically a, a Hawaiian value. You know, it's, we think uh, we we're part of nature. In nature, you can't abuse nature and uh, and uh, without not only harming nature but harming ourselves. So if you think about future generations and our environment are very precious to us, we need to do things that will uh, uh, help us use nature, but in a way that it doesn't harm nature. So that's part of our, I think, culture to, to be sensitive to these things. Ron Walker was the State Department of Land and Natural Resources Wildlife Chief for the Division of Fish and Game during this period. He also conducted the field research for the Hawaii Department of Transportation under Dr. Andrew Berger from the University of Hawaii. One thing we immediately found out in doing the study at the reef runway was that the mudflats that are exposed during low tides constituted feeding areas for migratory birds, shorebirds, some waterfowl, and the Hawaiian still, which was interest to everybody. And when the tide came up, the mudflats were covered, there was no more feeding. It was found that while the aeo and other water birds fed on the mudflats of Keihi Lagoon, they did not nest there. At this point, mitigation was recommended to the Department of Transportation. Mitigation is uh, a word which means if you're going to harm something, you have to do something to uh, prevent that harm from being overriding. And in a, in a case of w wetland birds, uh, maybe causing their extinction or reducing them down to low numbers where they might be threatened. 170 acres of mudflats in Keehi Lagoon were about to be impacted by the dredging to create the reef runway. The first thought was to find comparable feeding wetlands for the aeo and other water birds. This provided the impetus for Ron Walker and a team of biologists with the Hawaiian Water Birds Recovery Team on Oahu to identify two areas around Pearl Harbor as not only suitable feeding areas, but breeding areas for the aeo and fellow wetland birds. Jerry Swedberg figured very prominently in this uh, recovery team and the recovery plan. Jerry was a biologist on Kauai for many years and then he went to the U.S. Navy Public Works and uh, was really instrumental in suggesting that the mitigation for the reef runway might be in the Pearl Harbor area on Navy lands. Consequently, the Navy offered two areas on Pearl Harbor's West Lock for environmental mitigation, Honouliuli and Wayava. Obtaining the land for these wildlife refuges was a major hurdle towards saving an endangered species. Getting the money for creating these breeding habitats was another challenge. At this time, environmental advocates, including the Audubon Society and Life of the Land, questioned the entire scope of the reef runway's impact on the environment. Among the advocates, a member of the Audubon Society, was a McKinley High School teacher, Betty Nagamine. She specifically addressed how the Department of Transportation would fund the creation of two bird habitats in Pearl Harbor and in compliance with the newly enacted NEPA. She proposed that the FAA help with the cost for mitigation. She came to my office and presented what she thought was uh, things that should be considered, particularly by the FAA, and, and so stated that it seemed somewhat nearsighted not to participate in it because our federal law was requiring this mitigation. As a result of listening to her presentation, I agree that we would attempt to find out more information on ourselves why we were not participating even though I knew at the time that we did not expect or did not feel that that type of function was included in the grant program. To everyone's surprise, Washington agreed. 
Betty Nakamina's efforts solved the problem of funding for the creation of bird habitats at Honouliuli and Wayava. Her initiative also set a precedent for future FAA funding of environmental mitigation for the rest of the country. Finally, construction of the reef runway began in 1973. concrete structure is a wave dissipation device designed to absorb the energy from waves that could get as high as 25 feet. It protects the reef runway. The strong wave action that we have on this side of the island uh, would uh, quickly overrun the, the reef runway. So we have this high uh, wave protective barrier and uh, the dolos forms a shield around it. A dolos is a precast element that is designed to withstand the movement uh, caused by wave action. It's deliberately designed so that it can rotate and move without losing its uh, position. Reef runway improves the safety at the airport because it moves all of the heavy traffic away from the other parts of the airport. We are essentially able to split the uh, airfield operations and that, thereby improving safety. It reduces noise because it's farther away from the populated areas of Honolulu. Okay. It improves the capacity, of course, with the runway because it provides an additional runway on which we could operate. A couple of years ago, we measured the uh, settlement that took place on the ends of this runway by uh, surveying methods. And on the, the east end, where the design settlement estimate was uh, two inches, there was no settlement at all. And on the west end, where the, the estimate was four inches, there was only one inch of settlement. We have a working runway that is uh, an asset uh, to the airport, but it's also an asset to the city because uh, of these other issues, the other three issues, the safety, the capacity, <coughs> and the noise reduction. Those things are certainly assets to the, to the city of Honolulu and to the state. It was very unique for its time, very ambitious project. Remarkable that the amount of funding needing, needed was provided by the, the FAA and the state. It was uh, the first environmentally controversial project that the Federal Aviation Administration had to deal with and uh, turned out extremely well. There were compromises made in terms of uh, mitigating with habitat that, that uh, are kind of a landmark. A meeting of the minds among the directors of state and federal organizations had occurred. The Department of Transportation Airports Division, Department of Land and Natural Resources, the Federal Aviation Administration, the U.S. Navy and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service all came together and agreed to help save a bird, the Aeo, and its fellow endangered species by creating a safe habitat to feed and breed. In 1977, the largest airport reef runway of its kind was completed. Has it withstood the test of time? I don't think there's any question that it has. It's, the, the runway is uh, over 30 years old now. It, it seems to be as good as when we saw it when it was completed. Uh, I don't have any doubt that it will last even longer. Here we are 30 years later almost and it's doing its job every day. It's all of the earth project. There are a lot of people that have come from around the world, literally, to look at the runway, to, to actually see it, uh, uh, to see how we're able to accommodate this, uh, this large task. Uh, it's still uh, looked on as a, an example of, of good design, good planning, good engineering. The final product uh, met all of our expectations. In fact, exceeded them. Uh, uh, Hawaii's uh, growth of tourism could not have been accomplished if we had only one runway, and which was also a joint-use military uh, airport. So, so with all of the uh, military activities that we have been going through, uh, the, uh, 
the impact on, on, on tourism in Hawaii would have been affected had we not had the uh, reef runway. It began with the reality that Hawaii had become the hub of air travel in the Pacific after World War II. The reef runway was built to meet this challenge by increasing the capacity of air traffic. During the course of planning, a bird and its habitat became a tipping point where progress needed to be balanced by a concern for nature. This challenge literally halted the construction of the reef runway. In order to proceed, the leaders of this project had to find it in their hearts to do the right thing, what Hawaiians call pono. I believe the project turned out to be very successful and it did survive the many, many challenges by the opponents to the project itself. The uh, initiatives taken did definitely show that the state of Hawaii had a concern for the environment and was willing to go the last mile to protect it. Probably I'm most proud of the fact that <clears throat> we were able to get together a, a complete team of, of uh, people that not only supported it uh, from outside standpoint, but people that would work with our, our people to design and build a runway like that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I look back on the whole Reef Runway project as a, uh, a very important life experience for me personally, because I was a relatively young biologist in the middle of a very controversial project. <laughs> Looking back on it, uh, Overall, I feel very satisfied about the way it came out. It was a very large, very complex operation. It was really a privilege to be involved in it. And with uh, working with so many competent people, dedicated people, uh, one doesn't get the, uh, that kind of opportunity too often in life. And for me to have been involved in that was uh, really something that I treasure. The mitigation project showed tremendous foresight in terms of the environment and anticipated many of the requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act that are standard practice today. It provided a template for future wetland habitats in the islands. And most importantly, the number of Aeo is on the rise. In 1973, Dr. Andrew Berger, ornithologist from the University of Hawaii, estimated the total number of Hawaiian stilts in the islands to be 1,000 birds. In 2005, the revised recovery plan for Hawaiian water birds estimated there were about 1,350 aeo in the islands, an approximate 35% increase. A significant increase in major part due to the two habitats created by the airport reef runway. These habitats set a precedent for later statewide habitats which have, over the past 30 years, collectively contributed to the rise in waterbird populations. To this day, the Pearl Harbor habitats ensure ideal nesting places for the aeo and other wetland birds to safely breed, preserving and protecting endangered species. The Honouliuli and Waiava National Wildlife Refuges are symbolic of Hawaii's love and respect for the land. In 1977, Hawaii had built a world-class airport with a first-of-a-kind runway, quiet and safe enough to be near a major metropolitan area, long and wide enough to provide landing for even the space shuttle. And most importantly, this project represents how various state and federal government agencies and departments can work together to provide for the needs of Hawaii's tourist industry and also protect its environment. The Hawaii State motto sums it up. For Maokeao Kaina I Kapono, the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. <laughs>